Okay. Paul, thank you for, for joining us, and especially for this uh, elongated version for people who are really into uh, Google Consumer Surveys, and there are a lot of them, I will tell you that. Let me cut to some nitty-gritty stuff here. Um, as I mentioned, I have read almost everything in the print media side of things, online and offline, that you've done so far, and you have been very forthcoming um, about what's going on. But let me ask you a real basic question here. Sure. Um, Google Consumer Surveys was really designed for publishers, and it was, as I understand it, uh, specifically to address the problem of eliminating, um, you know, pay to read. I'll, I'll call it. There's, there's, there are better phrases. That being the case, why does Google care? What's about? What is it about the business model that made Google care about? Pay to read, as I call it. Well, why does it matter to you? Sure, it's a good question. I mean, for us, having free content online is really important to Google because uh, it's the way that we access it to index it for our search engine. Uh, it, our mission is to organize the world's information. So, being able to access that information uh, for other people to read is really one of the most important things we do at Google. And what we had seen is that these publishers, because they couldn't make, uh, couldn't make money with their content online, or had trouble at least making that money, they've been packaging up this, this content into applications uh, to sell on mobile phones or uh, tablets. And while that's a, it's a good user experience, those applications, um, you still have to pay for it. And then Google doesn't really have access to that content any longer um, because it's sort of specifically for that application. And uh, so we wanted to keep the free content online. That was really the impetus for this whole project. Okay. So you guys are obviously willing to make an investment um, to those publishers to make sure that that content stays free. Yeah, absolutely. I think Google has been doing a lot of things in the publisher arena to try to get people to come to their sites and read their content. Uh, in the end, we serve ads on that content. Uh, we um, can direct people to interesting content online that's free and available for them. And so it's in our interest uh, to keep these publishers uh, online and producing really interesting content. Okay. May I ask you, well, like, of course I can ask you, um, <laughs> what, what kind of a budget does Google have? Um, because you're paying an amount to the publisher, um, but you're obviously, but the, oh, that's only 50%. Yeah. Of what the actual, I think it's 10 cents a question, right? Yeah, so we have two pricing options for consumer surveys, depending on how you target your, uh, your respondents. So if you do a general pop uh, survey, it's 10 cents per response. Uh, if you target it to a specific audience, so whether that's demographic audience like males who are 18 to 24 years old, or targeting through what we call a screener question, which basically screens out the people that you don't want. It's a two-part survey. Um, those are 50 cents per response. And, you know, we've modeled it out so that we're basically breaking even um, at, at least to start uh, on trying to give sort of the publishers this revenue uh, without, you know, taking a lot of money out of our own pockets. Uh, and so that's kind of been the model to start. And, you know, I think as we add new features to the product and uh, new business models, you'll see us really try to make some revenue out of this project. So right now you're happy to be breaking even on it. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, uh, for the success of this project and sort of the influence it has within Google, I think we need, we need to be a, a business that's making money. Um, but it's not our focus right now. Really, we're trying to build a product that people want to use. Mm -hmm. And once we find uh, that there's a market for it, we can really invest in it and, uh, you know, try, try to figure out a way to make more money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the other angle to the surveys is that it has been marketed to marketers, which goes beyond the publishing realm. Um, and, and that generally has been noted by people. Um, but that, that, that it seems to me that diverts you away from the core issue, which was helping publishers. So explain, explain the other side of it. Yeah, well, so it's an ecosystem, right? We, we, we need to be able to take in payments so that we can pay out the publishers um, originally, our idea was not around market research at all. We were kind of focused on these, what we called human computation tasks. 
things that computers weren't very good at doing, but humans were very good at doing. Things like labeling an image or um, categorizing a product or figuring out, figuring out the best query for a set of search results. Mm -hmm. These are things that we need to do at Google to make our search better uh, and our other products better. And so we thought maybe there was a big market for that with other companies uh, where they would want to sort of uh, outsource this work uh, to, to humans all around the internet. Um, it turns out that people don't really want to do that online <laughs> to get access to content. Uh, we saw when we did our initial tests um, in the very beginning, the response rates to the human computation tasks were much lower than the market research type questions. Uh, the quality of the data was actually pretty good, but we couldn't get enough of it to be uh, sort of an interesting business. Did you so, um, Paul, did you, beta, uh, did, you beta, did you beta test that with any marketers like, I'll just throw out P&G, General Mills, or somebody like that? Uh, beta test which part? The, the, what you're just talking about, about labeling. The computation the, stuff? Yeah, or? yeah. yeah. Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, in fact, at Google, we have a ton of these tasks to do already. So, and we use um, uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk to do some of this stuff, uh, and for uh, and we have our own folks that do it as well. So, um, we actually took those tasks that we had and tried to run them on a publisher site and see what happened. Um, and like I said, I, I think it was a really interesting experiment and maybe a place that we'll go to. Uh, in the future, but at this time, I don't really think there's a market for it at large. Okay, all right. Now, um, when you rolled it out for the publishers, I did see the handful of relatively small publishers, except for people like um, Adweek, and I believe the New York Daily News was one of your initial um, yep. testers and such. Uh, has it really rolled out to much larger numbers and, and to, to many people that we, we would recognize nationally? Yeah, so we have, a, we have a handful of national brands, uh, New York Daily News, uh, Christian Science Monitor, uh, Adweek, uh, Pandora, we play it on, or we put these surveys on YouTube as well. So these are sites that um, the average internet user visits, you know, once a week, uh, uh, like a site like YouTube, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are on some very large national brands. Um, but really, kind of the interesting part here is that the smaller papers, the more regional papers uh, or, or sites, uh, the, the completion rates are better, the content is more interesting to that audience, and so they're willing to actually complete the surveys. Uh, we get higher completion rates, and uh, we get a better geographic spread of the data by sort of focusing in on these, these little geographic areas. So we have you know, small and medium-sized papers from... Uh, from the uh, Star Tribune to uh, a small paper like the Lima, Ohio News. Um, and so uh, we, can, we can access people all over the country by focusing on some of the small papers that maybe you as an Internet user wouldn't visit every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, the, the responses that are collected to the, to the research questions, that is the property of the publisher. Is that correct? No, uh, the responses are the, the property of the person who conducts the research, so who pays for the research. Oh, the publisher okay. doesn't have access to any of that data. Okay, uh, I see. All they get is the payment for uh, the, the response. Right, okay, all right. How many different research companies you know, have, have tried this so far? I'm sure you're keeping a pretty close track on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any numbers to share with you, but uh, I, I guess what, what I can say is we've had the very, very large market research firms all the way down to the small and medium-sized businesses that we service every day with our other products like AdWords and Analytics and Google Apps. And really, for the market research side, uh, that's been our focus, the, the smaller businesses, because they haven't had access to professional quality market research before. And uh, this is really sort of democratizing that for them um, and, and giving them access to tools that uh, they would have to pay thousands of dollars for uh, before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me talk with you about how this whole survey, um, idea, not the idea, but how the surveys these, uh, themselves, the process that you go through, the methodology, 
uh, that was used to put this together. I didn't get the um, feeling from the Q&A with Lenny yeah. that you had really brought in professional market researchers either internally from Google or externally from somewhere else to help you put this together. Am I wrong about that? Uh, yeah, I, I, we, we have. So what what happens, so at Google we do a lot of market research ourselves. Um, uh, our marketing team does most of that and then we have a specific team of uh, sort of market research professionals, uh, survey scientists, um, user experience researchers, uh, folks who are more familiar in ad-based research and so we've relied very heavily on them uh, in sort of reviewing our methodology, helping uh, with uh, a lot of the statistics and, and methodology around that. We also have um, several folks from Stanford who uh, work with Google on a regular basis, helping out and reviewing um, both the stats and the, the research methodology. Okay, very good. Um, did you also take it out like for beta testing to kind of refine it with, with companies and such? Yeah, in fact, um, uh, so again, Google does a lot of market research. We started with our products, and then before we launched, probably two months, two or three months before we launched, uh, we were running uh, surveys with other external companies that were in the San Francisco area, which is where we're located. Um, so if you look on our website, a lot of the case studies are from uh, companies around this area that had real business problems that we worked with them to solve through Google Consumer Surveys. Okay, good. Um, somewhat of a political question. Sure. Um, I, I don't recall the woman's name, but four, five, six years ago, some very, very experienced market research person was hired by Google. Yeah. And from that point on, I think the research industry looked at Google as... Um, a, a long-term research competitor um, and something of something out of Star Wars, and I don't mean on the good side, <laughs> um, that seems to have evaporated. Because from everything I read, I know there was a presentation made in Texas a couple of weeks ago at the Market <laughs> Research Technology event, and your representative there said, look, we're not going into the market research business. That's not where we're going. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, we're we're not we don't have a team that will do syndicated market research. Uh, we don't have the expertise nor the time to do that. We're we Google is a technology company, and so uh, what we've built is a platform um, to think to get what we think is the most representative sample of the U.S. population, uh, and tools for market researchers to create surveys and and analyze them. And so what we do is we use all of the data that we can, we can get and all the tools and technology we have at Google to build what we think is sort of a first-in-class um, analytics tool for market research data and, and a survey creation tool. Um, and I think that's where you'll, you'll continue to see us focus instead of you know, going out and creating syndicated research, which we, we really don't have expertise in and um, quite frankly, we don't want to do. But, but the aggregate of all the information that you do have access to that you could uh, churn into something that would have great potential market research import, you know, is there. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have uh, lots of data about how people are using the Internet, how they're searching for things, um, uh, how they're participating in our social network, Google+. Plus. Uh, and our other applications, and uh, yeah, I think I think you'll see us enable market researchers to use that data in conjunction with survey data to kind of bring um, sort of a, 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 another level of information uh, uh, to bear on business problems and business issues. And so, uh, you know, I think we we're really early in the days of Google Consumer Surveys. But uh, I think soon you'll see some of that come to bear and um, be uh, sort of a, an interesting take on a lot of the traditional ways that people do market research and solve these problems. Okay. So far, is Google Consumer Surveys um, producing, um, is it meeting the expectations that Google had internally? 
It's exceeding our expectations. We really didn't know what to think going into it. Um, you know, we had obviously modeled out the business and tried to figure out, you know, what it would take to make it successful. And I think, you know, it's still really early. So we haven't seen uh, the uptake from some of the bigger uh, market research firms or, or companies, although a lot of them have tried it out. But the, the real success has been, again, in sort of the lower end, the mid-market and the lower end of the market, where people wouldn't have access to this before and now are creating um, really fantastic market research and solving real business problems that they have. But obviously it was designed to help publishers no matter what their size. That's right, uh, publishers as well. So uh, I think the publisher angle, on the publisher side, it's been tremendously successful. Uh, we're offering publishers uh, RPMs much higher than they can get almost anywhere else. So. The, the survey unit itself averages between uh, uh, 12 and $18 RPM just for that unit alone. Uh, on, uh, that's in addition to the revenue that they get uh, uh, for the ad units on that page. Mm -hmm. So uh, the publishers are, are very interested in it um, and are sort of banging down at our door to, to get into the beta that we're, we're running right now. But, um, and, and from, again, the market research side, we think that the the small and medium sized businesses uh, have been using this in ways that we didn't expect and uh, and more frequently than we expected. So it's it's been really nice. When you say you've um, uh, exceeded your internal expectations, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What were your expectations? Uh, like I said, we we didn't really know what to expect um, because this is a if you look at the, sort of the the criticisms that we get from the market research industry uh, in terms of um, what we're doing. I think the biggest one is that this is a one or two question survey at the most. You can create more questions in a survey, but we serve them up one or two questions at a time. And because of that limitation, um, we weren't really sure if people could use it and find value from it. But it turns out that, you know, I think one of the, the most interesting things that we've seen is that um, People are using it to, to kind of gut check their, their decisions that they're making on a daily basis. So instead of, you know, trying to come up with a huge survey to um, uh, uh, sort of measure their customers and how they're reacting to their products, they're making their decisions uh, for their products ahead of time and then just sort of gut checking them on our, our platform with one or two questions. And we see this kind of over and over. It's an interesting pattern. I think the other thing that we're seeing is that people are testing the incidence rates of, of different types of consumers around uh, the United States. And you can do that in one or two questions uh, because, uh, you know, all you have to know is like, you know, if you want to know what percentage of the population uh, uses an iPhone or an Android phone uh, or which percent of the population has a stapler on their desk. You know, you could do all of that very quickly uh, and get uh, responses back in less than 24 hours uh, on our platform, which I think you just couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a specific uh, compart compartmentalized uh, types of questions uh, that are being used, not, not the same questions, but the same genre of questions over and over again? And, you know, are, do you see something like that? Yeah, uh, I think there, there are definitely different segments of questions that we see. Um, I think the, our formats kind of lend themselves to certain types of questions as well. So we've done a lot of work in rich media formats uh, where users can choose between, you know, five different images. So we see a lot of, like, logo design testing or product design testing or packaging testing because it's really easy to do and it's engaging for the users or respondents who are, who are participating. Um, we see a lot of, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to understand the validity of our data, the accuracy of the, our data. And so we see a lot of those kind of validation tests. Um, you know, uh, either questions where the audience has a known incidence rate and so they're trying to measure whether or not, you know, we can get to that incidence rate or they have questions that they run on their own, uh, with their own providers or vendors, and they're trying to kind of figure out what we're doing. And I think the other thing that we see um, is a lot around ad testing, uh, marketing messaging sort of testing, 
Um, we see some politics, some economics, um, actually so a, a wide variety of types of questions. That's been kind of the most interesting part. It's fun to watch these surveys come in and see what people are asking. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we have a, a, we review each survey as it comes in. So we get to see um, the types of questions that, that they're asking and kind of help users who may not be familiar with market research refine those questions uh, so that they are asking better questions to their audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's been the publisher reaction so far? Like I said, I think uh, publishers are kind of knocking down our door, trying to get into, uh, trying to get in these, these what we call micro surveys up on their site because we offer them a better alternative to paywalls and uh, their users enjoy actually uh, responding to the questions um, and they're making a lot of money. So I think people, uh, the publishers are really interested in, in the product. What about the uh, opportunity for publishers to ask questions themselves about their own v media vehicle in order to release that content? Yeah, absolutely. We see that quite a bit. Um, uh, a lot of publishers actually are trying to learn. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Is that going on? Yes, that is going on today. Uh, so we can target a survey to a specific publisher. And so publishers say, you know, I want... Um, uh, you know, I want to ask my, my own readers about the content on my site or uh, their consumer behaviors so that I can use it in my, my media kit to, to attract potential advertisers. Um, we see a lot of that sort of testing going on, and publishers are finding that they're just as valuable as the market researchers. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long um, was the beta test supposed to last, and how long is it going to last? Yeah, so uh, let's see. We started this, this project in July of 2010, uh, and it was just a, what we call a 20% project at Google where uh, uh, the engineer who leads the engineering team uh, that I work with uh, and I were going back and forth on some ideas, and we hit upon this, and we actually went to the Huffington Post, and we said, you know, do you want to run a million impressions of these things just so that we can test it out? And so we did that to the, with the Huffington Post in July of 2010. And at the time, we were both um, in other jobs. I was the product manager of Gmail and led that team. And so I didn't really have time to work on it. And it turned out about uh, a year ago, we kind of got together as a team. And um, at Google, we have this thing called autonomous units, where they're kind of like startups within Google. And for people who have been at Google for a while and shown success, uh, you have they give you kind of complete autonomy uh, uh, on a, a specific project, on whatever you really want to do. So you get a budget and a headcount, and, um, and that's what we got about uh, a year ago. And ever since, we've been testing it on uh, various publishers. And I think it's going to take another year or so to understand whether or not there's a real market for this and whether or not we can make a real business out of it. Uh, and so, you know, from now until uh, that year, we'll be releasing features every couple weeks. And we have already done four releases. And uh, I think you're just going to see more and more interesting stuff come out of uh, Google Consumer Surveys. Um, the, the, what I have read is that uh, the, the, the whole idea that we see now uh, that is reality kind of you guys stumbled into it about two years ago. When, yeah. did the, when did the Google Consumer Survey unit actually get established? Uh, you mean our team? Yeah. Yeah, so our team uh, was established in uh, March of last year, of 2011. Okay. Can you talk about the size and the shape of that team? What, you know, what kind of skills and what kind, how many people are, are working there? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, we're, a, we're actually a, a medium-sized team at Google. Most teams at Google are between five and ten engineers and a product manager and a marketing manager. Um, my team's uh, around 25 right now. Uh, we have uh, a couple product people, so myself, um, uh, a marketing manager, some UI designers. Uh, we have salespeople, we have operations folks, and we have a team of engineers. Um, that, that sort of make up the most uh, or the largest portion of my team. Um, and so uh, at this point, we're, we're kind of a, a good-sized team at Google. 
Um, and like I said, we, we are developing in a way which allows us to release uh, much more quickly than any other team at Google, I think, at this point. Uh, we release to production uh, about eight times a day. So uh, not all of those have new features that we turn on, but uh, we can, if we have an idea, we can code it up and uh, put it out into production within a couple hours, which so, makes so it... What, so what you're telling me, if I understand you, is that you, you are testing like mad on all sorts of new ideas all the time. Yes, like crazy. <laughs> I, I think you'd be surprised, blown away even uh, at how much, we're, uh, how much we're testing. And, 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 uh, give, and give me an idea of one that worked and how quickly... You, you put it into, uh, into the environment. Yeah, I, I think our image, uh, some of our image formats are a good example of this. So when we launched, we started with this image format, which was basically a side-by-side -side image uh, where you could pick one or the other. Uh, turns out that given the space we had in that little square that we put on uh, our publisher sites, uh, the images were just too small. And so uh, one of our, our sales guys came up with a good idea. Uh, uh, we worked with our UI designer to actually create um, create our new format, which is kind of like a, what you would see on a like a car website where you have like little colors and you select one and the, the the color of the car changes. So there's like little tiny images and then a big image below it. Uh, anyway, so we we basically coded that up and released it in about a day and a half. Uh, and so that, that's with all the testing, all the work that we did. Um, and, uh, you know, in a day, a day later, all of our researchers had the ability to, um, to use that format. So it's been, and that sort of stuff has been really successful. As we see issues with people sort of uh, either completing surveys through the flow or we see uh, issues in our completion rate with different formats, or new features come up, we just do them. And it's, it's really actually pretty freeing and um, uh, makes it a really fun environment to work in. Okay. You rolled this out, I'm trying to remember the exact date, early May? Uh, end of March, actually. Okay, end of March. Yeah. Um, what are the most substantial changes that you've made in it since then? Yeah, so I think all of the changes that we've made thus far have been in response to um, uh, asks from our customers. Um, so um, probably some of the bigger ones are around the visualization of the, the data. Um, we've added a lot of things so that you can control the look and feel of the data. You can combine answer options. You can, um, you can export the data, share it. Uh, all of these things that our people have been asking for as they, just, as they use the product. We've also made a lot of changes on the publisher side. So when we first launched, uh, our initial version of this was a, an overlay of the entire site. Like you had to, um, uh, you couldn't access anything on the site and at the very top was our question uh, with the alternate action that the publisher provided. And since then, we've moved it in, in line with the content. We've alighted the content or obfuscated it below so that you can't actually read it, uh, kind of making it a more of a paywall. Um, and that, that has increased our completion rates and uh, reduced any of the, the minor complaints that publishers get about sort of protecting this content. Um, so it's been really successful on the publisher side. Um, we, we've been working on some longer term things, so you haven't seen the fruits of a lot of our labor. Um, but internally, we've been using these tools and it's been really, really nice. How happy is a Google corporate? with uh, what you guys have accomplished so far, particularly since you talked about how rapidly you've been able to bring this thing into existence. Yeah, I think our team has been sort of a model for, um, for innovation in, within Google. Uh, since we moved to a new structure, uh, at Google we, we basically have a structure where there are product divisions and, um, and within those product divisions, uh, the products that are worked on are sort of features of the larger products. So in our social division, everything that is worked on goes into Google Plus or Google Search or one of the other places where our social products uh, come out. Uh, in uh, the Chrome division, it's the same thing, like Google Chrome, our browser. Um, this, is, this doesn't really fit into any of those organizations. And so um, what, we've, what we've been able to do is... Uh, 
work outside of the, the technology that most teams use and uh, build things very quickly, as I mentioned. Um, and I think people are seeing that as a, a sort of an interesting way of creating a product here at Google um, and a sort of more innovative way uh, to get something done quickly. And uh, I think in, in terms of the reception at Google, I think that's how people are viewing it as this is kind of a really neat idea, an innovative team and someone and a team that moves very quickly. Okay. Over and over again, I've seen that Google's emphasis is speed. Yeah, among you know the the very top priorities. Absolutely. Um, th this survey is supposed to deliver responses or complete completions uh, in I think a twenty four to seventy two hour window. Um, early on, one of um, one of my friends, Kelly Styring, um, who actually did a, an interview with us, having used Google Consumer Surveys, and she mm -hmm. told me and told our audience that it had taken like a week to get mm -hmm. all the information. Was that an anomaly? Um, I think probably when we first launched, uh, we had a lot of surveys coming in and we didn't have a lot of publisher inventory to put them on. So um, that's kind of the marketplace that we're working with. You know, we have to kind of grow both, both sides at the same time. So as we, as we get more researchers coming in, uh, we have to open up inventory on publishers to actually serve up the surveys. So initially, uh, I think the the surveys came in uh, at a, probably around three to four days, uh, maybe in some cases a week, depending on how you're how you were using it. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, it's less than twenty four hours if you want it, um, and uh, because we just have more more inventory on the publisher side. It's going to obviously vary from publication to publication how many answers you can get in a given period of time, but what's the range of of completions, quote unquote? That, that researchers want um, on a typical project? Yeah, so we actually limit the number of um, responses that you can get per, per question, depending on the type of targeting that you're doing. So for a gen pop survey, the most that you can get is 2,500. Um, for a targeted survey, the most that you can get is 1,000. And we do that because you actually don't need more. For, it's no more statistically significant uh, if, if you have more responses. And so we're trying to limit people from sort of shooting themselves in the foot and paying more than they should. Um, and at the same time, you know, the fewer number of requested responses we have, the faster that we can get them done. Um, I would say, on average, the, the typical number of responses requested for gen pop surveys is around 1,000. And for the targeted surveys, is around two to five hundred. Okay. Have you gotten any feedback from the researchers doing these surveys that they're getting information that they feel they couldn't have gotten in some other methodology? Yeah, I think again, some of our question formats are a little bit different than uh, most vendors have, and so a, a lot of those sort of image-based questions um, are are types of data that you couldn't get before um, or couldn't get very easily. And I think you'll see us do more and more of that sort of thing because um, of the other limitations that we have on our product. Um, I think that the thing that we see the most or the hear the most is that um, it's not that they, they couldn't get this type of data before, but they couldn't get it as fast or as, or as affordable as they can here. So mm -hmm. what it means is it's not only that it's, it's cheaper for them, but they can do more of it. You know, they can do follow-up questions to larger surveys. They can test incidence rate. They can test the, the wording of the question to make sure that they're getting the data that they want. Uh, and so we see that over and over again. The, the, because it's so fast, you can, do, uh, you can do more with it in shorter periods of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you talked previously about all the demographic information that you guys have and and, uh, and and know about people who use Google and such. Is there any thought at all to trying to aggregate that with the information that is being collected by these two survey questions, maybe as a, an additional add-on service? I mean, that would be, it seems to me that would be a great revenue source for you. Yeah, so we, we already do some of this, um, and this is why you can run a one or two question survey and still get value out of it. So um, 
for every question that you run today, we, we automatically infer the age, gender, uh, we know the location of the respondent, so we can use that in conjunction with census data to understand whether or not they're living in an urban, rural, or suburban area, or what the median income for that area is. And we allow you to segment the data by all of those demographic facets for every single question that you run at no extra charge. So that are, a lot of that already comes for free. So um, that's kind of an in, invisible appending that you're doing. You know, for that's right. Yeah. That's right. And it actually makes the data really valuable because then we can pull out interesting insights in the data, sort of statistically significant differences between subpopulations. So you know, if, you, if we saw within your data that uh, men were more likely to answer one way than women or uh, that age affected the way that people answer a question, Without you having to look through that data, we can pull that out and show that to you. And we have this a tab in our interface called Insights that automatic, automatically does that for you. Mm -hmm. All that being said, we have even more data about users. We know um, the interest that, uh, that they have based on the sites that they browse. Uh, in aggregate, we know what people are searching for. Uh, so uh, we can use that data and bring that data to bear um, um, on these results. And so, uh, again, I think what you'll see more and more is that we're using the data and the technology that we have at Google to add layers of insights on top of, um, on top of just the, the raw responses that you get back from respondents. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I'm a researcher and I write the two questions, um, who's minding those questions on, on the other side for Google? Is it done by computer? Is it done... Manually, is it done by a combination? Yeah, it's done by a combination. Um, so we have certain policies that, uh, because we have this ecosystem where we're, we're pushing these surveys onto publisher sites, the publishers have an interest in keeping those questions um, reasonable for their audience. You know, um, they don't really, they, they don't want a lot of very sensitive questions being asked on their sites. Uh, and then we have policies at Google that we apply. Uh, both to our ads and to the survey questions in a similar fashion. So every survey that, that comes in, we review uh, both automatically for some po policy violations, and then also, <clears throat> excuse me, also we have a, a human look at each one. And uh, uh, that person is there to really make sure that the, the quality of the data that the researcher gets back is going to be up to par with what we expect from uh, our platform. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks who are new to market research who are asking questions in a way that will bias the answer, or they're doing things like push polling, or, um, you know, they're trying to use this space as an advertisement for their product. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not really what we're trying to do. So uh, we, we review each question and make sure that it applies to our policies. Okay. Do you have to ever have to go back to the publisher and say, yeah, this is kind of on the line, uh, should we allow this? Uh, we don't do that for specific publishers. In aggregate, we look at all of the, the questions and we make decisions on, on a, um, you know, a frequent basis, I guess, uh, as to what types of things we want to allow in our surveys. There are definitely things that are on the line. Um, you know, some, as an example, uh, one question was trying to <clears throat> understand the incidence rate of uh, uh, gay males who were 18 to 24 year old who also were swimmers. Uh, so you have to ask someone, you know, what their sexual preference is, and that's uh, that's just that's kind of on the line for us. Although it may not be in a normal um, with a normal vendor uh, an issue for us because we're serving these on publisher sites, they're pretty sensitive to that type of information. Okay. <clears throat> so let me give you another example and and see what this might how this might work. Let's say that I'm a publicist for um, a, a rather racy um, Hollywood starlet or something like that, okay? And yeah. I want to put, I want to ask two questions in the New York Daily News, you know? Okay. Big, big market and uh, a lot of people and open, you know, across the board to all kinds of personalities. And I want to ask two questions about, you know, what do you think about my, you know, the person that I represent as a personality and are they over the line? I mean, is something like that a presentable type of issue or question? I think in general that, that sort of thing is okay. Um, we, we don't allow uh, 
researchers to, to do anything which is um, sort of in the spirit of being hateful or discriminatory okay. or, or otherwise. And so, um, you know, again, these are all lines that we have to draw and, and sort of review for, for each survey that comes in. But I think in general that sort of thing would probably be okay. Okay. Uh, is there any limitation to the kind of political things you could ask? For instance, let's say that the Romney campaign wanted, again, use the New York Daily News and ask, A, do you, number one, do you think Obama is a socialist? And, and two, do you think Obama is a Nazi or, or something like that? Where, where are we tipping the scales there? Yeah, I think both of those are sort of uh, push-pulling in nature. You know, they're trying to influence um, uh, uh, the, the respondent in some way, and so we would probably not allow either one of those. So, so push-polling is really out. You're not, you're not even allowing that. No, we don't allow any push polling. Okay. All right. Great. Now, and by the way, I should clarify because uh, you mentioned a couple of times that as a researcher, you may want to target a specific site. Right. Um, we don't actually allow researchers to target specific sites. So we ah. spread out um, the questions across our publisher network. And then, um, but if you're a publisher and you want to ask questions on your own site, you can do that. So I just wanted to clarify that. I got you. Okay. So. So you're as just as likely to have that question asked in Lima, Ohio, as yep. in New York or in Austin, Texas. Yeah, in fact, that's that's actually one of the the um, the strengths that we have. You know, we can get respondents that you normally wouldn't get uh, through uh, another vendor or panel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one of the other criticisms, and maybe you haven't heard it as much as I have, is uh, the length of the questions. Yeah. What's what's so special about a hundred characters? Why not a hundred and forty like Twitter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, our uh, I think the, the most important thing to us is the respondent experience. Uh, in the end, we're, we're users of the internet, and so we want to have a good experience on a publisher site. Uh, we want to have access to that content and, and do do so in a reasonable period of time. And so we thought that, uh, and we actually looked at some data in terms of response times to understand at what length of question or, or answer option does, um, does, it, does it become an issue for the respondent to understand the, the question, to kind of grok it and answer the question accurately. And so uh, we, we sort of hit upon this hundred character limit. It's actually a little more. You can go over the hundred characters um, and at some point we'll actually stop you from, from adding more. But, but the point is that we want to make a really uh, good experience for the respondent and I think in a lot of research um, vendors don't and researchers aren't thinking about that and so they end up creating these really long or obtuse kind of questions where instead they could more concisely sort of say what they want to say and get the responses that they want. Uh, so it, it, it causes them to think a little bit more about the questions that they're asking. Have you considered uh, creating some sort of an, I don't know if this is how it's done, uh, some sort of an algorithm that would help a researcher or whoever's asking the question to pose the question in a really well-developed market researchy format and still <laughs> have the respondents you know, back um, in the process? Yeah, I think as we get more and more questions to search over and sort of under, and produce a, a, a sort of a machine, machine learning algorithm which we can get the questions that have the best responses, the most accurate responses, the fastest responses. We can suggest question uh, structure to, to researchers as they add them. And I think you'll see us do that in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's important if I can make the point to you because I have had some researchers you know, say to me that to to properly structure a question, uh, particularly about a product or service, um, you may very well have to spend the first 50 characters kind of laying out, you know, the framework from where this question's being asked from. And so the, I've had some say to me that they're extremely frustrated by the 100-character yeah. limit. So take it for what it's worth. No, I mean, uh, we, we definitely want to respond to the people who are using our, our product and um, build a product that they want to use. Uh, 
at the same time, we want respondents to have a good experience. So it's a balancing act. And I think, you know, we, we drew a line in the sand at 100 characters or maybe a little more than 100 characters. Um, and that may change over time as, as we see um, the frustration build or uh, what we're hoping is that researchers will find new and interesting ways to ask questions uh, that don't require a lot of, uh, a lot of words. Okay. A lot, another criticism I've heard is that the representativity of the kind of person who goes on to publishing sites to read material yeah. may be very limiting uh, insofar as uh, you know, the researcher and what they're trying to find out. What's your you know, response to that? I mean, I, I, Google has a very, very large publisher network uh, uh, with our AdWords product or AdSense product. Um, and these are the types of publishers that we're going after in our product. I think if you look at our validation studies, we have a white paper that we put out um, that tries to get at the representativeness of our users and how accurate our data is. Um, you, you'll find that it's better than existing uh, and existing vendors out there, whether that's uh, internet panels or probability-based panels, um, we can do a better job at, in shorter amounts of time for less money. So, uh, again, you are uh, if you want a, a specific type of audience uh, or set of respondents that you can't get on the internet, uh, you're going to end up paying a lot more money and, and waiting uh, a lot longer to get those results. And uh, if that's... Um, that's what you need to do. I think that's fine. So you, you sort of have to make that trade off yourself. Okay. How many uh, uh, publishers are in that publisher network? I know they're not all involved at this point, but how many are there? Is that a public number? I don't know if that's public, so I can okay. share it. All right, fine. Um, um, I'm running out of questions, but one of the last ones questions I have is sure. we've talked about the $0.10 cents, uh, a question versus $0.50 cents a question um, yeah. survey capability. Can you give me an idea percentage-wise how much of it, it that's breaking down so far? Yeah, so I think um, probably about 70% of our questions are gen pop questions, uh, so the 10 cent per response. Um, another 20% are the screener type questions, so the two-part questions, and then probably around 5% are demographically targeted questions. Okay. What are the major areas that the Google Consumer Survey team is pretty focused on in, on improving? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I, I think there really there are a couple interesting areas that we're approaching um, today. So one is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think Google has a lot of data that we're not really using um, to the benefit of researchers. So we're going to start looking at ways to use some of that data in aggregate um, to, to provide sort of layers of insights on top of the, the raw responses that researchers are getting back from our platform. Um, I think another area is uh, sort of more periodic surveys, uh, brand trackers, or, or any type of tracking survey. So you'll see over time that um, uh, so scheduling of surveys, um, different visualizations on how responses change over time, um, sort of very quick and easy to set up brand trackers uh, that are uh, affordable for even small and medium-sized businesses to run. Um, internationalization is another area that we're really focused on. Um, the U.S. is a big market, but uh, the U.K., for example, is an even bigger market for market research. Um, and then there, there are a lot of areas in the world where researchers have trouble getting uh, respond, respondents. So uh, a lot of the African countries um, that have sort of emerging markets but don't, um, don't have the infrastructure to do market research today. And uh, because we're, again, we are on publishers or we have publishers in our network that are in these areas, it makes us easy, easier, it makes it easier for us to access those users. So I think the, 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 the last thing I want to mention real quickly is the mobile side of things. Um, I don't think mobile has been, has been done very well uh, in terms of uh, fielding surveys and, and getting respondents. And uh, we have a unique opportunity to do something well with our Android platform. And uh, I think that's, that's an area we're going to focus on uh, pretty heavily in the, in the next couple months. So that's going to become part of this, become part of this as well. 
Okay. So a year from now, this is going to be a radically different looking, you know, service, isn't it? We hope so. I mean, I hope a couple months from now this will be a radically <laughs> different service. Uh, the thing is, like I mentioned, we change so quickly uh, that, and have the ability to push things out so quickly that um, we get to respond to our customers as they come in and, and raise these objections, raise these issues. And it will just get better and better over time. That's, that's what's really exciting about this project. Okay. I think this is the last question. Okay. Uh, search engines, a, a very, very competitive area right now. Uh, there's, there's a lot of war games going on there. Sure. Um, it, it, part of this has got to be um, considered of, of potential really big benefit to Google, isn't it? And have you had any um, information at all that indicates that your competitors are even thinking about or, or planning to do anything like this? Um. Let's see. Uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think knowing more about your users is an important thing for any company, especially Google, um, and allowing our advertisers to learn more about their customers, uh, I think, is seen as a benefit within Google. Uh, so that's, that's why I think Google as a whole is interested in the market research side of this project. Um, in terms of the competitive space, I think everyone is out there, uh, you know, trying to bring the masses of data that they have uh, together in a way which, you know, they can, they can pull some inf interesting information out of it. So I don't know if we'll see the same exact thing or similar methodology from other competitors, but I think they're going to use their data in ways that will benefit uh, their customers, whether those be advertisers or, or business partners. So, um, uh, yeah, I expect a lot of competition in the space. And uh, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it uh, a place where we want to we want to be. And just so I understand it, Google can make use of the information you're collecting for the researchers as well, or, or no? No. Uh, so only the researcher really can use that, that data. Uh, we don't use it in any other Google products. Paul, you have been extremely forthcoming and very generous with your time, and I appreciate it.